What's up, y'all? What's going on? I'm on the road. I really want to pull over and shoot this video, but I'm going to shoot it while we're on the road. First of all, I want to thank everybody for subscribing to the channel, following. Make sure you follow me on my Instagram. The podcast was sold on Instagram. Also, this week, today is September the 7th, 2024. This Friday, my one-on-one -on -one online coaching program is dropping. So be on the lookout for that. I'm right outside of Baltimore right here. Shout out to everybody in Beatmore. On my way to D.C. I just saw this car. I was driving and this car was weaving in and out of traffic. In half a mile, keep right at the fork to continue on I-895 South. Follow signs for Baltimore Harbor Tunnel Thruway, Annapolis. Live TV, baby. Live TV. You see it, man. You see it. Born 1969. So this car, man. Keep right at the fork to on, continue on, on. I-895 South. Come on, come on, come on. go this way, I'm going to go this way. Um, so, this car, one of them charges, is weaving in and out of traffic. Just now, just now, just now, this nigga weaving in and out of traffic doing, I don't know how fast he was going, but he was dipping because I'm doing like 80 something. He was dipping. He blew by me. Sure enough, about two minutes, three minutes later, he flipped the car over on the side of the shoulder of I-95. This is where I'm at. He had to climb out of the passenger door. The car was on his side like this, standing up like this. He climbed out. And he was fine. I said, man, you lucky to be. I pulled over. A bunch of people pulled over to check on him, see how he was doing. He was all right. I said, man, you lucky to be alive. He looking to my, yo, how my lip? I said, man, your lip, nigga, you lucky to be alive. I think he was like a Spanish or Indian kid, like India or Pakistani or something like that. Could have been Spanish too. So, but anyway, man. My greatest accomplishment so far in my life has been raising my son, man, from day one, because I was there in the, uh, I was there in the delivery room when he was born. I was there. I saw the whole thing. I greeted him when he came. As soon as he got here, I greeted him. Up until now, he just turned 13 in May. And I remember when a friend of mine, my man Joe, Joe O, Joe Orsita, Italian dude, true friend of mine, true friend, sent me money when I was in prison, real friend, real friend, that's when you find your friends, when you're sick and you're in trouble, that's what my mother always told me, she said you ain't gonna find your friends but two times, you ain't gonna find your friends but two times. When you sick and when you in trouble, whoever come there, them your friends. That's what she used to tell me. She was right. She was right. He told me when I was getting, when Sean was 
when his Sean's mother was pregnant with him, he said, Sean, he said, man, this is the best thing in the world. I said, what? He said, man, being a father, man, he said, this is the best thing in the world. This is the best. And I didn't know at the time, you know, I'm 55 now, fit over 50. Sean was four, I was 42 when Sean was born. Sean was, I was 42. And man, his words, he couldn't have been more right because this is the greatest thing that I have ever done, man, was to raise my son, man, and be in his life. Every day, I'm going through the tunnel now, y'all. Y'all want to see? Look at that right there. Live TV. It's live TV. So I've been in Little Sean's life, his whole life except for the 16 months that I did in federal prison. That was the only time I was away from him. And when I got out, I got right back in his life. I jumped right back in. I didn't waste no time. So I just called him on the FaceTime. I just called him on the FaceTime. And I said, man, you brush your teeth? He said, yeah, man, I brush my teeth, I wash my face. You know, he makes his bed every morning. And he said, I had a boiled egg, I really wasn't that hungry. I asked him, I said, you had some cereal? He said, no, nah, I just ate one of the boiled eggs, I wasn't that hungry. And, you know, he just started the eighth grade. And I raised Sean I've raised Sean to be independent. GPS signal lost. The GPS signal lost, Sean. I've raised Sean to be independent of me, right? Because that's how I grew up. I grew up in the 1970s and the 1980s. I was a latchkey child. That was a term they had for us who grew up in the 70s and 80s. And what that meant was, being that our parents worked, and during that time, both parents and the majority of families worked. So when you woke up in the morning to go to school, your mother or father was already gone to work. So you got your own self together, you fixed your own breakfast, got yourself dressed and you left the house with your key and you locked the door and you walked to school or caught the bus to school whatever it was and then when you got out of school your mother or father was still working so you walked home and went in the house locked the door and made you something to eat watch tv watch cartoons or whatever did your homework and then went outside to play until your mother got home and then that's when you ate. You understand? And in my case, sometimes my mother would work a double. Sometimes she would work a double because my mother was a nurse. She would work seven to three and then sometimes she called me say, listen, I'm gonna work a double. I'm gonna get some overtime. So I'm gonna go three to 11 too. Hold on, I gotta pay my toll. Put the toll out. Hello? Is there a toll? Ain't nobody here, yeah? Ain't no toll? They must gonna send me. Wasn't no toll there, y'all. They must gonna send me a. They must gonna send me a joint in the mail. They go to 5 0 right there. Gotta put y'all down right here like that. So she said, I'm working three to 11. 
So then I was on my own. You know, I had to come in. She would call me, said, well, come in when the, when it get dark, when the street lights come on, you come in the house and call me. And sure enough, sure enough, when the street lights came on, I would go in the house. Well, a couple times I tried to try and stay out late when it was dark until she whooped my ass once or twice and then I said, nah, we're not going to be able to do that. It's got to be a better way. I might as well, I need to go on in the house when she tell me to go in the house so I can stop getting these ass whoopers. So I grew up as an independent child. I grew up as an only child, right? So I'm okay being a loner. I'm okay being alone. When I'm alone by myself, I'm not lonely. I'm just alone. You know, I know how to entertain myself because I grew up as an only child. But anyway, you know, I'm watching my son grow, man. And man, it really is the best shit in the world, man. You know what I'm saying? It really is, man. And it's the best thing I've ever done. In two miles, take exit four for I-295 Maryland South toward Baltimore Washington Parkway, BWI Airport. Um, I done made a million dollars. I done traveled to I've been on three continents, been to Africa, been to South America, been to Brazil, been to Egypt, sat on the pyramids, been in the Sudan, went all through Luxor, the Valley of the Kings, Valley of the Queens, South Africa, all through the Caribbean, traveled the world. I didn't have sex with beautiful, beautiful women all over the world. I drove dope cars. I've worn the finest clothes, tailor-made suits, Hickey Freeman suits, Brooks Brothers suits. I done done all of that. In half a mile, take exit 4 for I-295 Maryland South toward Baltimore, Washington Parkway, BWI Airport. Had cash money to the ceiling. $650,000 in cash. $300,000 cash. Take exit 4. But none of that compares to continue my, for 32 miles none of that compares to my son man none of that compares to the happiness and the excitement and the joy and the feeling of success that I have being a father to my son man that shit don't even come close don't even come close. Don't even come close. Because I'm watching him grow up right before my eyes. Right before my eyes. He's all, he's almost as tall as me. You know, he's in the eighth grade. He's starting to speak up for himself. He's starting to have his own opinions. I remember when I, I remember, man, the first time he might have been a week old or two weeks old. And I went by his mother to pick him up to bring him to my house in Jersey City, New Jersey, by myself. I had never cared for a human being 
that was two weeks old. And he was my first child. He's my only child that I know of. That I know of. And I remember driving him to Jersey City, putting him in the car seat, and taking him to Jersey City. And I had I had diapers and bottles and pacifiers and onesies and all kind of shit. All that baby stuff. And I remember taking them in my house, man, and it was just me and him in my house. He might have been nine days old. And I was looking at him like, yo, I've never done this before. This is crazy. And I did it. You know, you learn there's an instinct. I know they say there's a motherly instinct, but there's also a fatherly instinct. You know, when he would cry, when he would shit on himself, I would change his diapers. I washed him, gave him baths, uh, everything, fed him, bottle, all of that. All of that, everything, everything everything and then to see him now at 13 going to the 8th grade that shit is dope dope because I can see my tangible success right which way am I going y'all 695 I can see my tangible success I can touch it I go home he give me a hug he tell me dad I love you you know what I'm saying he, he I know he got my back he loves me unconditionally best shit in the world man word is born man it's tangible I can see my success he is my success, right? And he's my greatest accomplishment, man. My greatest accomplishment, man. My greatest accomplishment, hands down. Nothing, nothing comes close. Come on, man, what is this guy doing, man? What you doing? So I just wanted to make this video, man, because that was on my heart. That was on my soul. You know, and I lost all my money, right? I lost a million dollars. I lost 1.2 million, right? I lost all my money when he was born. From all the pressure from my fair case, I made some horrible decisions and blew all my money, right? But in a way, I'm gonna get it back though. That ain't no thing. Once you've been a millionaire one time, you know you could do it again, right? Once you had a lot of money one time, you know you could do it again. Like I ain't no doubt in my mind that I could do it again. It ain't no hope, it ain't no wish, it ain't no fantasy. If you've never made a million dollars, if you've never made a lot of money, it's a fantasy, it's a dream to you. It's a, it's a hope, it's a wish. You think about luck playing the lottery, but when you a nigga like me, that's already did it one time, through flat-footed hustling and hard work, elbow grease, you know you could do it again, right? You're confident you could do it again, because you did it once. But I know for a fact, I know for a fact, and I often say, Sean, this is one of those times in life where the sun, moon, and stars stepped in to your life and took your money from you. The sun, moon, and stars did that. Because it wanted you to focus all of your, everything that you possess inside of you it wanted you to focus that on this little boy and for you to be the father to him that you never had. And in order for me to do that, he had to take the money away. He had to. Because when I was a millionaire, I was wild. 
that money made me reckless and it made me careless. The more I got, the more reckless I became. Come on now. Let's go, let's go. Um, you know, I was, when I had all that money, man, I was dealing with like about six or seven women, eight women at one time. Right? Paying car notes, tricking with some, paying car insurance. Um, some of them just loved me and wanted to be with me. You know what I'm saying? But I was I was that I was that wild. See at that point in my life, see my dick ruled me. My dick was in charge of me. It told me what to do. And I was so uh, immature, even though I was in my late 30s, early 40s, I was so immature. And I was totally misguided and misinformed of what success was. I thought that when you had a lot of money and a lot of women, right? That was the ultimate measure of success. Fool them, devil. Wrong. You know, and I know that if I would have had that money when Sean was born and had my business, because I lost everything. I lost my businesses. I lost everything. And I went to prison. I know if I would have kept all of that and had him, I would have kept breaking the law kept making more money and I think I probably would have been don't come over here I think I probably would have still been messing around with a lot of women right and I wouldn't have put in the quality time that I put in, that I have put in him, that I have put in with him over the last 13 years, right? That I was broke, right? Because when I got out of prison, I was dead broke. Still broke now. You know, I would have most likely just been buying them sneakers, clothes, bikes, toys, and thinking that was sufficient, right? That that was sufficient. And when I did spend time with him, when I had visitation with him, if I would've had the money one of them girls would have called and told me, Sean, come on over here and get some of this pussy. I would have been finding a way to drop him off early on my visiting time to go over there and get that pussy. 100%. 1,000%. 1,000%. I told you, my dick ruled me. And I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have been the same father, man. And I share this all the time, and I know some of y'all be looking at me like I'm crazy when I say this, but when I had the most money, I was the, I was a weaker man. This is the National Security Agency right here, the NSA. It's right here. Look at that. Washington, D.C. When I had the most money, I was the weaker man. I was fat, I was out of shape. I was deceitful, I was manipulative, I was a liar. I was fake. Um, I bought situations, I bought people because my money could. That's how I used to live. 
That's a true story. This is a true story. What I'm telling you, this is a true story. I bought people. And my whole perception of what success was was totally different. Like today, I know that success is number one, maybe not in any particular order, but let me just list these. Not saying not one is one, two, or three, because they're all important. Self-love is very super important. Self-love in my health. My health is probably most important because if I don't have my health, I can't take care of Sean, right? So my physical health is priority number one. If I got good health, I'm a success. If I love myself, which I do, I'm a success, right? If I'm confident and my self-esteem is high and I accept myself for who I am and I approve of myself as I am, I'm a success. That's success. And downloading all of my wisdom, all of my street smarts, all of my uh, academic intelligence, all of my wisdom, all of my common sense, downloading everything, all of my soul, all of my spirit, all of my heart, downloading everything that's inside of me into my son. Downloading it, download it with no viruses. Clean download. I'm a success. I'm a success. Notice I didn't save money because I'm not, this car that I got. This is a 2012 Honda Civic, and I don't got a lot of money. And that's all right. But there are a lot of dudes that got a lot of money and a fly car and self-esteem is low like that. In the dipsy dumpster, down in the basement. See, you can't let money and things and material things determine how you perceive yourself. Because then it's not real. Because when those things are gone and taken away from you, then you don't, then you, you fold. Forward. So, this is my greatest accomplishment, man. My greatest accomplishment is raising my son his whole life. And if I had a daughter, if I had a daughter, Cause Sean loved me, but the way them girls love their fathers, man, is ridiculous. I would love that. You never know, maybe one day I may have one. Any young girls out there wanna have a baby with me? Nah, I'm just playing. All right, man. Thanks for watching. Down here in DC, shout out to everybody in DC. I'll let y'all later. Peace.